Welcome to Off Hours, a conversation between John Edwards and Chris Manning. I see you've added some bananas. Uh, yeah, we have a couple of bananas here in the uh, in the the pod. We've we've finally put a vent cover over the uh, the vent that we have just to suck some fresh air into this place while we're recording. Since we sort of turn off the main AC when we come in here, Rich decided to put some bananas as the grill cover for our uh, our vent. Well, your recording pod just wouldn't be complete without bananas. Of course it wouldn't be. I also maybe need to do some graffiti in here too, or uh, you know, do some stencil work in here because it's all canvas walls. So there's no reason why we couldn't uh, do a little bit of graffiti work in here as well. Maybe we'll add a banana or two in here. And now that you've got the the fresh air pumping through, you don't have to worry so much about how long it'll take to air out after you finish with all your graffiti. Exactly. Yeah, we've got some airflow in here, and and that's that's not so bad. And we're not going to. Uh, you know, start going uh, a little bit crazy from the lack of oxygen in here either. Well, I for one certainly appreciate the, the fresh air right now. My wife and I were both feeling pretty pretty groggy this morning, and uh, I realized that like the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds in our house had, had spiked thanks to my handy little air quality monitor, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I'm pretty sure that's that's why we weren't feeling so great. Yeah, and we've been trying to keep the the windows open uh, in the evenings just to air out the house. We've got some new furniture in. And they've it's been off gassing. Ah yes. So I don't have a garage I can can throw it out into to finish off gassing. So uh, that's not been been pleasant about mm. that side of things. But it's surprising. Like years ago, I would have had no real clue or, or correlation exactly why we were feeling the way we were, why we were both kind of just went head back to bed rather than uh, get up and, and get about our day and, and get moving. If you don't have any sort of air quality monitoring and, and try to or endeavor to be productive, I highly recommend getting one. You'd be surprised just how much that how you feel hmm. is correlated with what you're breathing in. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. So a couple episodes back, we were talking about your Fears Watch with the, the Lander in 48 in it. Yeah. And uh, I was going to mention at the time, neat little series of, of chronograph pictorial books from the mid-century, hmm. and uh, we, we got off on a tangent elsewhere, and I never really rounded back to it. I neglected to bring it up last episode as well. So I'm bringing up this episode, and uh, and that is the Ensemble Graph series by William Oath Smith Jr. Hmm. and Sr. This is a father-son duo, and they went to an extensive amount of work publishing a series of small books that essentially teach you how to service, correctly service, just about any chronograph that was on the market at the time. And that was sort of the golden age of mechanical chronographs mm-hmm. uh, so it, it's a, a great resource for anyone who's working on these these vintage movements and and whatnot and uh i was surprised to, to learn that you were not aware of this series either so i'll have to get you a copy of, of the lantern 48 yeah i had never seen a copy of that and I've, I've never seen that series i've got a couple of different book series from people in the past who've done uh you know done these sorts of servicing books but i i don't think i'd ever seen anything specific about the lander not that i've really dug into it yet or or look for one, but yeah, I should uh, see if I can find a copy of that because that would be very, very handy going through this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole series is is remarkably well done, hmm. uh, given the the time that it was it was made in. Yeah, um, I don't know exactly what process went into to making all the the diagrams and everything. Uh, if they were woodcuts, my hats off to whoever did that. But more than likely, it's it probably etchings that were were done and then and transferred. Well, over, it depends on when depends on when it was printed. They were not, they, you know, they got out of woodcuts a while back, John. I, I, I grew up with woodcuts. Come on. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you're not that old. What, that, what were the what Hardy Boys? What were how were those done? Uh, okay, so those were those the were blue um, ones. yeah 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 those were uh, those were copper plate engravings. Oh, okay, all right, all right. Copper plate took over for woodcut prints uh, quite a while ago, um, just because copper was far easier to engrave accurately than than wood was. So yeah, the, a lot of those books, if you know, what the ones you're thinking of, were probably copper plate uh, prints that were done. And given the um, volume that those were printed in those blue bound Hardy Boy books, uh, I'm sure they they probably were a metal substrate of some sort, most yeah. likely copper. Yeah. But even you know, photographic uh, plates were being done, you know, certainly 50, 60 years ago. Uh, there was a, there are a couple of good documentaries. Uh, I have to see if I can dig up from the ones that I'm thinking of. There was one in particular. It was the last day that the New York Times printed on their traditional um, printing presses and they moved over to um, the current digital, completely digital prints. And I'm trying to remember the name of it now, 
anyways, it was it was a fascinating look at how they converted photographs into dithered images, which they then transferred to, I think they were zinc plates that were put on the big rollers for printing onto the you know onto the page, and uh, it it was quite informative in terms of how they were taking photographs and putting them onto print plates and stuff like that. So yeah, there was certainly certainly options available. 70 years ago for printing uh, photographs and as opposed to just doing uh, doing woodcuts or doing engravings of some sort. Yeah, I imagine this is something more modern because it's quite good detail and very fine line work that they have on all the illustrations and the books are full uh, of illustrations and, and diagrams. So it's a, just a really good resource for any watchmaker working on, on vintage pieces. Hmm. Excellent. I'll have, to, uh, I'll have to dig into those and See if I can find them. I've uh, been slowly bringing my my library over from the house to the studio now that I finally have some bookshelves here, and um, I wanted to make sure that my books were somewhere that were protected here. So I've got doors on my my bookshelves, which has been a little bit awkward thanks to a couple of particular books which are larger than the depth of my bookshelf, which is a little annoying. Thank you, Guido Mocafico. Yes, I, I didn't notice that when I was at home because my bookshelves at home don't have book have doors on them, but uh, these ones do. Uh, but I also wanted to keep them protected from the dust and everything here in the in the studio. But now that I'm I've got uh, somewhere that I can use them again, I can uh, slowly bring them in. So find that those and add them to my collection. Yeah, I have the same problem with uh, a number of the books that that I have pertaining to watchmaking. A number of them are meant to be coffee table books that sort of sit on or under a, a coffee table. But uh, when I finally get around to, to doing some, some custom bookshelves at some point at home, I'm certainly going to be basing the dimensions off of some <laughs> of these larger books. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I have a one particular book at home. It's a um, uh, book of plates. It's a reproduction of uh, Rubeau's, um woodworking books. And it is massive. Uh, like I want to say that it's maybe close to 18 inches tall. And probably fourteen inches deep. It is uh, ridiculous just how deep, how big this book is, and uh, it it's a real problem anytime I want to put it on a bookshelf. So we've actually just laid it down flat on a shelf and then stacked other books on top of it because it's just it's a, it doesn't fit any bookshelf. And if you try to scale a bookshelf for this one particular book, every other book would look ridiculous on it because they would just be halfway back in the the shelf and it would be half empty so yeah it's uh it, some of these books i i mean i appreciate what they did with it this was a lost art press uh reproduction they did and they actually reproduced the books uh the original book one to one uh which was appreciated but at the same time it's a little ridiculous how big it is book that is a shelf yeah exactly so last episode you had also alluded to a, an online watchmaking course by christian lass and, and you've since actually in, enrolled in that class or, or downloaded the class and, and started to go through it? Christian did a number of courses that he put up online a few years ago. I don't know when the last one was put up. I think this one maybe was 2018 was when he released it. And he's done a number of them. The first one was the equivalent of the basic mechanical watch course that the BHI does, you know, how to service uh, a, an ETA 6497. And then he also did a separate one on servicing vintage chronographs, in fact. And then the other one was uh, sort of a master class, if you will. And in that one, he's taking the 6497 and he's making new bridges and, and cocks for the 6497. So he's leaving the main plate the way that it is, but he's replacing uh, all the other uh, plates that are in it. And so this series goes through exactly how to, you know, mark it out, lay it out, drill it, you know, do all the adjustments and everything that you need and then make the design choices that you want in terms of what it's going to look like. In his case, he's going from having two different bridges and a cock to a single three-quarter plate uh, that's covering most of the movement and then the balance cock that's there. Um, so it, it was an interesting course. I've, I've managed to go through and, and watch it all now. And uh, there's some great details in there if you're looking for information on how to customize a 6497 for yourself. And that's that's really what he's you know he's focused on in this case. Now, will you be drawing any inspiration from that for the movements you'll be putting in your own watches, or is that further afield? Yeah, eventually I can see doing something with it. It's uh, I've got a couple of ideas for a custom watch movement that I want to make. You know, I don't know how much it's going to be a part of my business, just because 
making custom watches is a tough business. Uh, you know, obviously there are people like Roger Smith who've managed to do it, and there's a number of independents who've managed to do it. But even then, a lot of these companies are relying on other manufacturers to help them out with things, right? Even when you look at somebody like um, like Hobring or Acrivia or anybody like that, a lot of those parts are being made for them by other people. And then, uh, you know, maybe to their designs or maybe just, you know, generic designs, and then they're building their own uh, movement plates to go around that and they're doing all the finishing and everything themselves. So, you know, if you want to build it entirely yourself from scratch, it's really tough to do. Uh, I think Roger's probably one of the few people that's getting as close to that as possible. I don't know who Christian else. Christian Klings is, is quite close. Is he? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, the problem is how many are you doing a year, right? Mm-hmm. You know, Roger has a team working with him. I don't know how many people are working for him now. I think he's around a half a dozen, maybe eight people. And they're still only producing 20 watches a year. And, you know, they're selling them for high five figures. You know, as a single person, I don't know how many I could ever make to, you know, and whether I could make it worth my while to do it. Having said that, you know, even if it's just a, an ego project to to make a couple of handmade watches or mostly handmade watches that are my own design, um, certainly this sort of course is great because it gives me a chance to see some of the skills that other people are using to build customized watches, you know, maybe sit down and, and use it for prototyping so that I can then sit down and say, all right, I like this. I don't like this. I can use, let's say, the gear train out of a 6497, but I can modify the rest of the watch to do what I want it to do. And then I'm not sitting down and making every single piece necessarily, but I am making sort of my own customized version of that watch and focusing on you know, on the things that are more interesting to me that I can do at a scale that are, that's appropriate. And also maybe some of it is CNCing it, right? I can, I certainly have the machines to do small scale CNC work like that. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a, I don't have a Haas machine or a, or a Kern or something like that around to do super high precision machining with. But at the same time, I can easily do the, you know, let's say the bridges and the main plate and stuff like that on my, on my CNC machines or even use the pantograph. Right, like the, I have ways of sort of industrializing some of the process and and turning it out faster, but when it comes to things like making the you know like the the staffs and things like that, I don't have a good way of accurately turning those in large numbers. I can certainly turn them by hand, right, but then all of a sudden it becomes less economical for me to do it, mm-hmm. and how do I make enough of those watches a year? and find buyers for those to be able to make a living at it. And sadly, I just can't do that. So on the the spectrum of of manufacturing and and craft, uh, where does uh, Christian Lass's technique land? Is it more on that that handcrafted, one-off piece side of things, or or is it more the industrialized CNC level? So it's it's kind of nice what he's done. He's, He's taking an existing watch. So you have to, you really have to have a 6497 already sitting there to, to take advantage of what he's doing. He's then using all manual processes to actually do the work. So he's got, you know, his uh, Shoblin 102 there, and, and he's doing a lot of the work on his Shoblin 102. He's got manual drill presses. He's got, um, you know, m- manual hand tools that 100 years ago a watchmaker would have used for doing layout and things like that. So the nice thing is that with a moderate shop that you know, a home watchmaker would have. You could certainly follow along with this project and be able to do it. In fact, you know, like the average shop that a uh, watchmaker who's servicing watches, right? Like, for instance, in your case, your shop is not designed as a fabrication shop, right? It's, again, it's not as if you guys have, you know, Swiss lathes sitting around and, and um, CNC machines and things like that for doing, um, for rebuilding parts. But you have the manual machines to be able to do the work that's here. You know, if you have an eight millimeter watch lathe, you can do this kind of work, and uh, and so it's a nice sort of a nice balance in in that respect. You couldn't make money, you know, doing these watches one off like that and trying to sell them, because the amount of the amount you'd have to charge for them in order to, you know, in order to actually make a living off of it, it you just you couldn't you just couldn't do it because with 
even minor industrialization, things like a pantograph, right? All of a sudden with a pantograph, you know, you could do a large amount of this work much, much faster if you wanted to do 10 or 20 of them, right? So it's sort of, it's nice because it gets you that that beginning point. If you want to go beyond that and you actually wanted to make 20 of these watches, you would absolutely need a different technology to be able to do that because you're not going to do that with, with what he's doing. Now, I have yet to see your, your pantograph itself in action. And mm-hmm. all pantographs I have ever been exposed to are just using like a, a scribe head. Does your pantograph yeah. have a, a live head on it? Could, could you mill with your pantograph? Oh, absolutely. All right. So oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. A totally different ballgame. Oh, so so my pantograph, I've got a Gorton pantograph. It's it's just a two-dimensional pantograph. I say just. Um, you know, it's still pretty magical when you see this thing doing a 20 to 1 reduction in, in a pattern. Uh, but it has a spinning cutter on it that does, I think mine tops out at about 8,500 RPM. And it's, you know, I put a, I can put a milling cutter in there, like an end mill in there. And I can actually mill material straight out of it. When you start looking at some of the more modern pantographs, uh, sort of the, the very last ones that were being made before CNC machines were, were really coming into their own, those will actually do full 3D work. And in fact, those are the kinds of things that are being used at, let's say, the Canadian Mint when they're producing coins. They'll actually do a very large uh, hand-carved or hand-detailed original and then they'll use a pantograph, a 3D pantograph, to actually sit there and reduce that three-dimensional model down to a smaller and smaller die that they can then uh, they can then use for stamping. And and I'm sure they've you know they've probably now moved on to CNC machines, but that's traditionally what they were doing. Uh, mine doesn't do the three-dimensional part of it, so I move the cutter down and it stays at that sort of Z height as it's cutting. But it means that I can do things like my moon phase watch dial that I've been talking about. That is something where I I have planned to cut out the moon phase window using that pantograph because I can drop the cutter down into that space and start milling out the silver that's on that dial in, you know, where that moon phase window is going to be. A number of watchmakers or watch manufacturers, rather, use these as well. For instance, mm. the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak dial, the sort of waffle mm-hmm. texture to it that's done on a a pantograph with a live head on it, or a form of a pantograph. I believe they've customized it, or at mm. least they, they tout having customized it quite extensively to be able to make those dials. And I know Vacheron Constantine uses it for some of their fancier case backs and sure. things like that as well. Uh, they're they're incredibly powerful machines, and really, when you look at them, they're as I said, they're they're basically the precursor to to the CNC machines that are out there now. And people are basically throwing these things out. Uh, you can get a decent pantograph. I mean, mine's. Mine is certainly nothing special, but it's it's a decent pantograph, and I think I paid about a thousand dollars Canadian for it. They're not horribly expensive. You can often find people who just want to get it out of their shop because it's a uh, you know eight or nine hundred pounds of cast iron that they don't want in their shop anymore, and it's um, you know it's not a small thing, but it's uh, it's an incredibly powerful tool, and again, it's one of those sort of mid twentieth century force multipliers that you can use to. Uh, to do this kind of work, I could easily see using it to produce. You know, probably not doing the drilling on a on a bridge or a main plate. Like I, I have actually got another tool that's specifically designed for that. That's um, that's designed to quickly drill out the holes in a bridge. If you've already got a, a master, it will drill out the. It's so it's sort of like a pantograph, but it's just one to one reduction or one to one copy. And it's designed for very quickly and accurately drilling out the bridge. But the when it comes to things like the profile or milling out the pockets and whatnot where the you know the wheels are gonna go, a pantograph, you could you could knock that out very, very quickly. So if I were going to try and mass produce, quote unquote mass produce some of these watches, I would probably use a combination of the pantograph and maybe a CNC like a small CNC mill for doing it just because you could do it at, at a large enough scale and fast enough that you could probably make some money at it like you could actually earn a living doing it but if you're you know if you're just sitting there and you you know you're wanting to do this again as sort of a a hobby project or something like that um you know not to sort of denigrate it like it's not you know I'm not saying that as if it's oh it's going to be a low quality piece but if this is something that you want to do and you want to produce your own high quality piece certainly an 8 millimeter watch lathe you just need some collets you need um 
a faceplate for it. And you can certainly do all of the work that Christian's talking about in this course. If you highly recommend it, yeah. And what you've just described is effectively what the Struthers have been doing with their 248 project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And you and I just had a chance this afternoon to, to physically distance and take in a talk by Dr. Struthers herself. Yeah, that was kind of nice, actually. Um, Rebecca was doing a talk on fakes and forgeries, which is what she wrote about for her PhD thesis. And um, Fellows Auction House was uh, hosting her giving a talk on fakes and forgeries. And so we, uh, we threw it up on the big screen here at, um, at the studio. And uh, you, me, and Rich were able to watch that, uh, that talk. So it was nice being able to see her talk about that. Uh, she did talk about and cover some of this during her, um, her talk at the uh, Horological Society of New York. But this was um, a nice addition to it. And there was a, a really good Q&A at the end of it as well that was, that was worthwhile. Mm -hmm. That was a really extensive Q&A. Yeah. I'd, yeah, I'd love to have that, that sort of Q&A access to uh, a number of watchmakers who are still alive. Yes. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting talk. I saw you got a, a good chuckle there out of the, the term mastige. Yeah, mastige was sort of an amusing term I had never heard before, and it's a, a combination of mass-produced and prestige. And I think that that perfectly sums up a large amount of the current watch industry, where people are mass-producing watches and trying to sell them as, you know, unicorn. <laughs> I was going to say something else. <laughs> we'll go with the unicorn eggs. Sell them as unicorn <laughs> eggs. Uh, unicorn horns. and uh, Also known as an alicorn. Uh, alicorn, right. And you know maybe they're not quite what they're what they're being sold as, or or as I like to uh, to tease people in the in the pen world, the uh, the the precious resin that pens are being made out of in the in the pen world these days. So that was a that was sort of an amusing term, but it was it was certainly good good seeing it. And uh, a lot of these fakes and forgeries are being called uh, Dutch forgeries, but although that's not entirely their origin, it was um, it was certainly interesting to hear about uh, how they got into the world and what they were trying to do. Which uh, makes me realize now you saying that uh, I, I should have perhaps uh, asked a, a question myself that has sort of been niggling at me both following the, the HSNY talk and uh, just hearing about her thesis in general. And, mm -hmm. and that to me is is whether forgeries is the correct term here because uh, as it was laid out, uh, it's more more of a fraud uh, to me. Because to me, a forgery is when you're you're putting someone's name on the dial and, and making it seem like uh, this watch was made by Breguet when, in fact, it was not made by Breguet. It was made by, by someone else. Where, whereas here, what, what these Dutch forgeries are, are doing is not so much saying that, oh, this watch was made by Graham, this watch was made by Arnold. Yeah. Here, you can, you can buy it, or, yeah. or Denter, or whomever. Yeah. Uh, but instead, they just make up some sure John Smith and, and throw London on the dial. Sure. And it's the London that, that is the, the key to garnering more value or uh, getting more money for the piece than it is in fact actually worth. I can understand that, although uh, there is a long history of forgeries which are not necessarily exact copies or, or forgeries of a particular artist going out there where they're, they're trying to imply that they were from a period and a time when, when of course, the painting wasn't actually done. Uh, there was a good, um, good book on was it Eric somebody another Eric Haburn I've got a copy of it and it's sitting at home I think right now um I'll look it up for the the show notes but there's a there's a really good book written by one of the most successful art forgers of the 20th century and he ended up writing uh, a good book on how he forged um his paintings and whatnot and and there weren't always in fact in many cases they were not actually you know a fake Rembrandt, but they were sort of implying that they were right, and and it's the same sort of thing here, right? Where it wasn't necessarily a forgery of a specific painting or a specific painter, but they were sort of implying that they were from the same era and the same quality, and uh, yeah, so I I can understand why why you might not call it a forgery per se, but I think it I think it's appropriate. A collective forging of the London watchmaking industry. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And today we have to, to deal with AI forging Rembrandts. There's mm -hmm. some pretty serious actual like painting computers, robots, yeah. uh, that can basically paint you anything you want in the Rembrandt style. Yeah, it's pretty crazy how, how good some of these AIs are getting at being able to paint and not just produce a like a laser jet or, or inkjet printing, 
but an actual painting of with real brush with real brush strokes yeah. and everything. Yeah, that's pretty pretty incredible what some of these will do. Yeah, and, and forging the style yeah. of Rembrandt's brush yeah. So it's it's unreal. <laughs> Yeah, if you're and if you're, this sort of talk sounds interesting to you or appealing. Uh, Fellows does have it available on their website. I think they're charging three pounds to get the video. If um, if you're interested in it, uh, certainly worthwhile. It was um, it's always nice hearing Rebecca talk, and uh, it was a uh, an interesting interesting sort of discussion about where the Swiss industry started and and sort of what these were and and what happened with uh, with them. And certainly, if you're ever thinking about buying. Uh, you know, sort of 17th, 18th century watches, and uh, and you're looking at these London watches, it's it's worthwhile knowing some of the history so that you can avoid some of the fakes. Although some of the fakes are still worth money, so. Yeah, as, as you were saying, even with the, sort of these medieval jewelry forgeries and yeah. fakes, they can still fetch handsome sums today just because of the fact that they're as old as they are and as well preserved as they are. Yeah, the Royal Ontario Museum, uh, the ROM, has an a, an amazing medieval art collection, and they actually have a nice little gallery of fakes. And uh, many of these fakes are now four or five hundred years old, so they are they are literally medieval fakes of either you know Roman pieces or earlier medieval pieces. And so the forgeries themselves at this point now are historical artifacts and historical objects, which are valuable from that sense. They're 500-year-old, you know, whatever, coconut cup or whatever it is. And um, and so it gets to the point where that's part of the history. Or when you see, you know, you go to Stonehenge. Well, today you can't go to Stonehenge and, and you can't actually see Stonehenge, you know, up close. When I was a kid, you could. And you could walk around and you could see Roman graffiti carved into the side of Stonehenge. Well, you Instead know. Instead of Princess Di? Exactly. It's not, you know, it's not 20th century graffiti, but it's still 2,000 years old, right? And so now all of a sudden the graffiti is historical and it, it, so it becomes part of the object. And it, same thing in this case, right? Some of the, the, these fakes are, these Dutch fakes are still two, 200 years old. And as Rebecca said, they ran, you know, they, they did what they, they said they were going to do and they actually tell, told time. And as she mentioned in, in the Q&A, too, it's some of the, these pieces that she handled went on to, to sell for quite <laughs> handsome sums. Yeah, like, yeah. When you consider the fact that they, they were forgeries, but they are uh, an artifact of their age. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm kind of curious. We were, we were joking a little bit. I wonder if some of these, you know, these fake Rolexes or fake Vachonals or whatever 500 years from now are going to survive and actually be worth something since, you know, they're, they're worthless now. You know, they're, they're fakes of a, of a modern object. But at some point or another, they are going to become historical artifacts in and of their own right, and if they survive that long. So I'm, I'm kind of curious if, you know, 300 years from now, there's going to be a collector of fake Rolexes. Yeah, there, there's a very big if there, because with a lot of these fake pieces and, and forgeries, particularly on the, the lower end, they're made with such cheap materials that uh, they'll sometimes degrade right on on the wrist <laughs> uh sort of the base metals they're sure. using or the poor quality paints and, and lacquers that basically just fall apart and, and self-destruct from the moment they they leave the assembly line in whatever nefarious place they from which they were birthed that's not very different than some of these fakes that were made 500 years ago that have survived though so a valid point i mean like, if you look at the the spectrographs that yeah. dr struthers presented showing how much lead and mercury are present alongside the gold in yeah. these watches it's a, it's kind of astonishing that they they've been able to persist and last in as good a condition as they have you know the amount of mercury that was in that one piece that she showed the xrf from i'm shocked that it still it still survives mm -hmm. yeah and in the condition that it does i mean you know if i can imagine that it would have survived at some point or you know to some degree but i'm i'm amazed that it's still in the in the condition that it's in and and speaking of the the current sort of fakes that are, that are out there on the black market, so to speak. Um, it, it is kind of kind of interesting to, to reflect back on, on this period that Dr. Struthers was, was focusing on and, and to, to realize that, that these Dutch forgeries, these fake watches that were purporting to be made in, in London and the occasional one from, from Paris as well, uh, that they were being made in, in the Swiss countryside. Yeah. And uh, the parts were being sourced there. And uh, unlike modern-day Switzerland, um, <laughs> who who are farming their 
a lot of their work out to to the very nations that are creating the vast majority of, of the current mm-hmm. uh, forgeries. Uh, they were actually securing parts and components for the watches from watchmakers back in London. So yeah. some of the more valuable and, and literal like front-facing components of, of the watch they would source from London makers. So you get an actual genuine London piece where it has the greatest value add and slapping it on something that was not of, of the same level of, of quality that was, was made in, in the countryside of, of Switzerland. And, and now things have, have sort of come full circle and uh, the Swiss are, are sort of the, the dominant kings of, of high horology. Uh, and we've got uh, China sort of sort of coming up, so it makes me wonder whether you know 200 years from now it's going to be uh, the Chinese, or I could certainly see the Japanese yeah. sort of being the the crown jewels of, of the horological industry. Yeah, it was it was funny seeing the the description of selling the dials. I think it was dials that that they were talking about, and it, I mean here are these enamel dials, gorgeous enamel dials coming from London. They were selling a gross of them, so 144 of them for six pounds something. Now, this was 1812 or something like that. And, you know, I, I I would kill to be able to buy dials like that. And and buying them by the gross is say, wow, that was impressive. But, yeah, it was funny seeing these uh, these dials being made, mass-produced in London. And, of course, that's what people are seeing. Same thing with the hands. Those are being made in London and then sent over to Switzerland to then be added to these fakes and, and then sold on through, uh, through uh, Holland. It'd be hard to turn down a, an enamel dial for a, a <laughs> handful of pence. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, anybody out there who wants to produce uh, enamel dials for me for that price, give me a call. I can. Uh, <laughs> we can make a deal. I probably couldn't even keep the the gas on in your kiln <laughs> that long. Uh, no, for that price. No, I couldn't. Uh, yeah, I couldn't. Uh, my kiln is electric, and I I certainly couldn't. I couldn't get it up to temperature for for the price that they're that they were charging for a gross of them let alone the enamel and mm-hmm. the work, you know, and yeah. the, even even if you were using copper for the base of the dial, uh, there's no way I could, even the, the copper would be more expensive than that. Mind you, you do have to, to keep, you know, inflation in mind and all oh, that. Oh, sure. So the typical English watch of the day was about nine pounds. Sure. So it makes sense that the, the yeah. dial was only a few pence. What's the typical English watch now? What's Roger charging for a watch? Oh, it's several <laughs> orders of magnitude more than that. <laughs> Although I'm not sure that's a typical watch, but yeah, that's... Uh, well, I would say it's a typical English-made watch. That's Absolutely. true. Yeah. That's true. There aren't a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And speaking of old medieval forgeries being worth quite a bit these days, you finally got your hands on a, a book you've been after for quite some time that's also worth quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, medieval European Jewelry by... Is it Robert? Ronald Lightbound. Ron- Ronald Lightbound. Yeah. Lightbound. Not, light- Not Lightbound or Light Brown, but Lightbound. Lightbound. Yeah. It's um, it's a book I've been searching for for 20-odd years, uh, probably no, 20 years now. I, I got into jewelry making through making replicas of medieval jewelry. And this is the book on medieval jewelry. Uh, Lightbound was a curator of medieval uh, jewelry and uh, metalwork at the V&A and understandably had access to quite a large collection of incredible pieces. And then, of course, he also had this amazing uh, contact network mm-hmm. through all of the museums of the world who happened to have any kind of piece that was related to his subject. And so he spent a big chunk of his career collecting incredible photographs and detail and information about the pieces that were on display there in some cases and on display in, in collections and others. And um, this book is, it's not an, it's not a tiny book. It's, no, absolutely not. <laughs> it's quite the workout if you want to try wor- reading it. And, uh, it but might, it might actually be worth its weight in gold. No, <laughs> no not, not, not quite. <laughs> not quite. That'd be pushing things. <laughs> it's not, it wasn't, it wasn't inexpensive, but it's certainly, it's certainly not that much. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an incredible survey of medieval jewelry and, Obviously, there there are a few finds that have happened since then. In particular, something like the the Staffordshire hoard, which has been you know unearthed since this book was published. In I want to say this book was published in the early nineties. And um, the unfortunate part about books like this is that they were published in very small numbers. They're obviously extremely expensive to to try and produce, and no one is interested in trying to reproduce this book or create a digital copy of it anymore. And a lot of them ended up in, in libraries around the world. 
And so, um, and a lot of libraries just are unwilling to sell on any of their books, even if it hasn't been withdrawn for years. Um, I've been able to get my hands on this a couple of times through various friends that have had copies. And um, even even most libraries are unwilling to loan it out through interlibrary loan uh, just because of the value of it. So it's been rather frustrating trying to use it for research in the past. And while it isn't quite as useful to me today as it would have been years ago, it is still handy. Uh, a lot of my work ends up pulling inspiration from classic pieces, uh, sometimes architecture, sometimes other art forms, uh, but certainly earlier forms of jewelry. It's I, I pull a lot of my my ideas and and uh, inspiration from earlier pieces like this. So for me, this is a, a brilliant book to be able to go through and see what was going on and what were the influences of it. And because he talks about some of that, I can then go back to the originals and I can say, okay, let's find the architecture that was being used at the time and and influencing the jewelry because there's always been a very strong um, correlation between architecture, which was driving innovation and driving design, then being pulled into the jewelry of the time so that you could carry a piece of art with you that reflected what you were seeing at the cathedral or what you were seeing at the, you know, the castle or whatever it was there, the palace that was nearby. So yeah, it's a uh, incredibly powerful for that, being able to find those examples and see where they were coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's certainly a, an aspect of, of supply and demand there with yeah. uh, books like this, where there's just so few of them are made and they're so hard to, to come by that the, the prices can, can quickly skyrocket. Yeah. I think we've touched on the fact here on, on the show before that uh, the first time I encountered Daniel's watchmaking book, I was oblivious to who Daniel's yeah. was. To me, it was just a, a book on, on the shelf at my local bookstore. Sure. It wasn't until a few years later that I actually decided I wanted to, to go out <laughs> and buy the book. And uh, pretty sure at the time that I first saw it, it was like $39.99 sure. Canadian, uh, which is you know, close to free in a lot of other countries around yeah. the world, thanks to the, the, the price of, of a coffee dollar. in yeah. some parts of the world. Yeah. Um, but when I went to go and, and buy it, uh, I couldn't find it in any bookshop. The only place that I could find it online was like, like $550 sure. that they were, were asking for it. And uh, it sounds like you went through something somewhat similar trying to yeah. track down this book at as well. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, at least with Daniel's, that ended up going into a second and then eventually a third printing. And I think even the third printing is still... Oh, is there a fourth yeah. printing now as well? And so that that's actually available in a at a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. You can you can go onto Amazon today and you can buy a copy for, for $70 or whatever it is. And if you don't have it yet, I'd recommend buying it while you can before <laughs> the prices. Yes, yeah, so I I'm, yeah, I may actually buy a second copy of it because I've I've had uh, I gave my my second edition I think to a friend of mine and and I've got a copy of the third, but it's it's something that I do actually use regularly in the studio. So it, it's a bit beat up, so I may actually buy another copy of that just to just to have a more pristine version of it. But yes, it's it's really frustrating that these books are only available in limited quantities. And then, you know, it would be really nice if they, I, I can understand why people don't continue printing them. The cost of printing these books. We, you know, we talked about Stefan Paolo uh, self-publishing his book on tourbillon and watch case making. And, uh, you know, the, just the sheer cost of publishing a book like that. And I can understand why people don't continue printing them after they've sold out their print run. Uh, it would be really, really nice if rights holders would make them available digitally, even for cost. You know, like sell them. Um, there are many of us who would be more than happy to sell, you know, to buy a digital copy. Uh, we spoke earlier about the um, the Roubaix Book of Plates that uh, Lost Art Press published. Chris Schwartz is the uh, one of the principals behind Lost Art Press. He's a woodworking journalist. Uh, he was the editor at... Um, at Woodworking Magazine for a number of years and a couple of others. And one of the things I love about them as a publisher is that they actually release a PDF copy of the book day and date with their printed copy. In fact, often uh, a couple of weeks early. And so I've, I've bought a number of his books and I have both dead free versions and digital versions of them at the same time. And I love that. I'm, I can carry it on my iPad. I can go back and reference it and I, and I can find it easily. And if it ever goes out of print, there's at least a record of it. There's something out there that people can get. Uh, and I know that things like Google Books have been trying to digitize, you know, older books and things like that. But the problem is copyright is still in, you know, enforced on some of these books, even though the rights holders have no intention of ever publishing the book again. And that's frustrating. It's We either need to dramatically 
trim down the length of copyright on these books, or we need to figure out a way of legitimately putting them out there digitally so that people can buy them. And, you know, again, I'm happy to happy to pay for these books as a reference book. I would have gladly paid for a digital copy of this, you know, this Lightbound book. In fact, I'd be happy to pay for a digital copy today. You know, if they, if, I don't remember who published it. I don't remember if it was the VNA that he published it through. I don't think Lightbound is still alive. But if whoever the rights holder is of that of that book now, I'd be happy to give them money for it. You know, it's a it's an incredible resource, and uh, if you're if you're out there considering publishing a book, seriously consider publishing a digital copy of it as well, just because it will last much longer than the the dead free version will. Provided bit rot doesn't come into play and it's backed up adequately. Yeah, but it, it you know it gets distributed around the world, right? It's, it's, yeah, uh, that's just it. It's far easier to distribute. And certainly in the case of medieval European jewelry, it'd be far easier for you to be able to carry that around on your iPad than it would be to, to lug that behemoth of a book around the, the shop. Well, you know, one of the things, I, like, you know, books like this, I've actually digitized some of these books myself. Uh, like I have a digital copy of, of watchmaking that I've I've digitized myself. And it's, you know, it's nowhere near as good as a uh, legitimate digital version would be, you know, if if I could buy one. Um, same thing like my BHI DLC course, right? If you look at the printout of that course, I think it, I think it's uh, eight and a half by eleven pages, and I want to say that it takes up a somewhere around eight or nine inches thick. They're actually, A four, aren't they? Oh, sure, you're right. They're A four pages, um, and you know, there it's it's like eight or nine inches of books on my shelf, thickness wise. Well, I can't. I'm not going to carry that around, <laughs> right? So I ended up digitizing it and I, you know, I have a copy of it on my iPad. I have thousands of pounds worth of books physically, you know, or thousands of kilograms worth of books on my iPad that, you know, only weighs a pound and a half. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to do that. And I'm, again, I'm happy to pay for this stuff. Give me the option. Give me, I, I'm, I'll give you my money. If, if you're writing a book that I'm interested in, I will happily give you money for both versions of it. And uh, and just so that I can I can have a good reference one on my on my iPad, a thousand books in your pocket. Exactly, <laughs> or even more than that. Yeah, actually, yeah. I would imagine if they the initial run was uh, a little overzealous on on this piece. Uh, it is such a large book that uh, that people probably would have been trying to get rid of it, like they try to get rid of pantographs. Yeah, and you would be able to scoop it up far cheaper. Well, but, that's uh, just the, it. The economies of supply and demand. Yeah, just were not in your favor. On I, I'm sure there's somebody out there who has you know three or four copies of it sitting in the back of a book drop somewhere and it's been sitting there trying to sell for 30 years i'd like to think there is but Mm. i i haven't found them and uh if anybody does have a cheap copy of it they're willing to pass on let me know i know other people that would love to have a copy of this book Mm -hmm. and one quick note on on libraries too you brought libraries up there and how a copy may not have been touched in years an interesting little factoid i picked up from a librarian shortly before the the lockdown began which i I dearly miss the libraries particularly for getting my, my kids out to them Looking forward to them opening back up again. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that, the little factoid was: it, it really is important that you not reshelve material. I, I always felt that I was obliged to, to put a book back that that I had I'd touched or taken off the shelf. Uh, but it's actually really important for librarians to to know that a book has has been touched, even if you were just pulling it off the shelf for interest's sake. Mm. Uh, they actually track and and they keep a record of uh, these these touches mm. and whether a book w- was looked at or. Uh, referenced in any way, whether you checked it out or whether you just happened to look at it there in the library. And it's important information for them to, to track to know what information to, to continue to keep hmm. within their collection uh, because libraries do have a limited amount of space. New sure. material is always being made. And that's the reason that the books like medieval European jewelry can, can sometimes escape mm-hmm. a, a library's collection because someone may not have, have touched it in, in 10 or 15 years and they yeah. decide we could fit eight other books in, in the space <laughs> that this book is taking up. Yeah. And and they decide to to sell it off from their, their collection. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, next time you're in a library and you take something off the shelf, leave it. Good to know. Especially some of the things that we tend to look up, uh, some of them are a little obscure, and mm-hmm. I'm sure that, in, I know in some cases, the books that I've pulled off of shelves, they haven't been taken out of libraries in decades. And, uh, and obviously it, it's worthwhile for them to know that that's actually something of interest to people still. Yeah, they're all, all manner of, of nerdy and obscure subjects. I am suddenly regretting reshelving. <laughs> should, should, should have just left them off. Now, now this book for you, is it primarily a source of inspiration or are there nuggets of craft and technique woven throughout? I find when books like this are written by 
um, people who had a career like Lightbound, and a lot of these books are like this. Um, there was a uh, watch handbook, I can't remember the name of it, that we, we discussed recently that was published in the last couple of years that was sort of a, you know, a survey of different different watches that were out there and the different complications and things like that that were out there. Effectively a collection of press images? Yeah, it was. It was it, a lot of them are press images from press photos of the of the watches. Uh, but you know, it goes through and it, it actually has some good detail about the the way these movements work and the way these complications work and things like that. Those and those books are written by people who are in, are probably not in my field. You know, I know the watch book was was written by a gentleman who's a collector. He was not a watchmaker, right? Ronald Lightbound is not a jeweler. You know, he was fortunate that he was a, uh, you know, he was at the at the museum and was probably involved in conservation of some of these works. But he's not a, you know, he's not a, a bench jeweler, for instance. So a lot of these are written from the point of view of somebody who is not in that field. They're not they're not that technical. Having said that. A lot of the photos and the details that you're seeing in these are better than you would see, even if you're, you know, visiting the piece, for instance, at the, you know, at the museum. So it gives me a chance to see, let's say, the back of a brooch. Mm. And I can start to see, oh, that's the construction technique they used when they were, when that brooch was made. Uh, some of the photos from the Staffordshire Horde are unbelievably useful to me as a maker because they're showing pieces partway through conservation. In some cases, they've actually removed, um, let's say, stones from a piece in order to be able to clean behind them or whatever. And so all of a sudden, you get a chance to see into a piece that you, in a way that you wouldn't normally see, particularly when you're standing there and you've got a pane of glass between mm-hmm. you and, you know, you're, you're two feet away from the thing. Um, so I use it as primarily a form of inspiration. Oh, there's a design. There's an element that I can pull. There's a way that I can use a material that I hadn't thought about before. But also, I can look at it and I can analyze a piece and I can see how is this piece constructed? What sort of techniques were they using? In the case of of a, a survey like this, jewelry technology was still changing. I mean, a lot of the fundamentals haven't changed in thousands of years. Things like casting techniques, uh, those have not changed in thousands of years. But there were technological innovations, there were leaps that were being made in terms of, you know, the way they could solder things, the way they could cut things, the way they could engrave things. And those were being made throughout that period. And so you get a chance to see, oh, before you had a jeweler saw, how did you cut this stuff? Well, it's not necessarily obvious when you're standing there looking at a piece in a, in a display case, but when you see a photo of it, and it's maybe multiple times life size, all of a sudden, you can see things like chisel marks. Like, oh, okay, they were using a cold chisel. They were actually cutting out that that part using a cold chisel. And maybe the maker has left some of those marks on the piece um, because maybe it, it would have been mostly hidden. Uh, it certainly would have been dazzling enough for, you know, that, that somebody wouldn't necessarily see the piece up that close. In the case of things like crowns, well, how close are you going to get to a ruler to be able to see the crown that's on their head, Right. In most cases, you're going to be seeing that on a person multiple feet away in a dark room lit by candlelight, and all you're going to be able to see is this glowing beacon on top of a person's head. So nowadays, we can actually get a better chance of seeing this stuff, and we can see those little marks that that an artist would have left in there that, you know, today we would probably cover up. But then it it was less important to do. So it's a nice combination of both. You know, in some ways, it would be great to see a bench jeweler sit down and say, all right, here is my, you know, here's my take on how this was being made. Here's what the information that I'm, you know, that I have about how this was being done. But at the same time, that's far less interesting to most people. And so it's a a fairly, that would be a fairly specific book, even far more specific than this, Um, you know, would appeal to far fewer people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thumbing through it, I I had to do a a double take. At, At one point I thought I saw an old ball watch, like the the, the original <laughs> yeah. carry along watch before they migrated to to pockets when they were sort of dangling mm-hmm. off a belt, and uh, it turns out it, it's a pomander, mm-hmm. which I had had not encountered before. I had no idea what a pomander was, so uh, thank you, Mister Lightbound. Uh, you mm-hmm. have enlightened me. I, it actually makes me wonder now whether those original watch designs, those very old and, and archaic watches, the very earliest watches, 
whether they were informed in part, or at least their their shape uh, was informed in part by by a palmander. So I, I'm going to blow your mind with another thing that was designed and and looked very much like a palmander. And and the um, again, I, I'm pretty sure that you're right. Those pocket watch, or those those carry watches were being designed from the same thing. And uh, these were actually hand warmers. Mm-hmm. And there are these little hand warmers. They're a sphere. And inside of them, it has a little gimbal with a small plate. And what you would do is you would put a coal from the fire on the little plate. And it would, the gimbal would allow it to stay stable so it wouldn't tip over. But it would radiate heat into your hands. And so you'd be sitting there in a cold court. A lady would be sitting there in a cold court or whatever. And she would want to heat her hands. And so she'd actually have this little ball, this this sphere and so she would actually warm her hands using it. And if, again, same size, you know, same sort of size as some of these palmanders, same size as some of these watches. And so, yeah, the it was certainly a shape and an idea that they had already been using. So it wasn't it wasn't completely new to them. But yeah, it's a. I, I've thought about making something like that, something like one of those little hand warmers. Uh, you know, figure out a different heat source, a modern heat source. It's a little bit safer, but. Yeah, it's sort of a neat uh, neat design idea, but those spheres were, were certainly being used for other things. Mm-hmm. And looping back to the air quality we, we touched on earlier in the episode, it, it seems that that is sort of the, the primary use case that, that palmanders had was yeah. to just carry around a, a scent. And uh, at the time, it was seen as, as being medicinal or at least being able to ward off bad things that you, you could be inhaling. Uh, they thought it could stop you from, from getting the plague yeah. and, and whatnot. And uh, the actual name uh, itself, the, the palmander is sort of a, a portmanteau, I, I learned, thanks again, mm-hmm. Mr. Lightbound, of uh, pomme d'ambre, which is translated from French as like an apple of amber. Yeah. And uh, they would often put amber or, or musk inside of these mm-hmm. balls to, to give off the, the scent that they wanted to use to, to ward off these evil spirits trying to, to destroy us. Well, in the early days, they, they thought the plague was carried in uh, bad smells. So, mm-hmm. you know, it makes sense if they... If your diseases are being carried in bad smells, then uh, you just you know, need some perfume. You just need some nicer smells, right? So you just need some some uh, you know some as you said some musk or or you know perhaps some potpourri in your in your pomander. And um, later on, when the uh, um, the plague doctors were going around, and you see those those great uh, those fabulous hooked noses on their masks, uh, those are being stuffed full of. Um, of potpourri and and various things like that to to have good smells so that they weren't getting sick as well. So, I, and I I have to wonder. I wonder perhaps if they were acting a bit like masks that were, you know, helping filter out some of the uh, some of the the disease that they were they were around. Maybe we should be uh, bringing back uh, those those masks for for us here in the the COVID nineteen days. That sounds like a great idea. Bring back masks to, to battle, battle COVID nineteen. I know. Oh, I'm thinking I think there's, this could I'm, actually there's, this could actually be effective. I, I'm thinking one of those lovely those lovely <laughs> ma- the nice long noses. I mean, that, uh, imagine walking into into Home Depot with that. You, I get weird looks right now walking in with a mask <laughs> on my face, and and that's a, a modern mask. This this would definitely stand out. Well, hopefully, uh, us wearing more modern masks becomes more socially acceptable, and uh, we can be rid of this, this whole COVID nineteen ordeal. Uh, but uh, hey, I would love to see you sport one of those medieval masks uh, around the streets. It'd be fantastic. Thanks for listening to Off Hours. You can find detailed show notes at offhours.show. If you'd like to keep up to date with the show, follow us on Twitter at Off Hours. John can be found on Twitter at Under the Loop, and Chris can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Silver underscore hand.